Welcome to this week's edition of Outdoors Online, a weekly webcast produced by the North Dakota Game and Fish Department. I'm your host, Tom Jensen. My guest this week is Mike Szymanski. Mike is a waterfowl biologist with Game and Fish. We're going to talk about the spring snow goose season. Mike, I guess, actually it's not a season per se. Uh, that's right, Tom. It's actually considered to be a conservation order in full legal terms. Uh, we call it a hunting season in our, in our hunting guides and our media releases because it's, you know, it makes more sense to people to, to call it that, but uh, when it gets right down into the federal law, it, it is a conservation order that was put forward by Congress uh, back in 1999 to help us address uh, overabundance issues with snow geese. And it's uh, designed to reduce the populations. Yeah, that's, that's the goal, is to uh, put more uh, harvest pressure on adult birds. Um, you know, in the fall, they're, they're coming down, and it, it seems like more and more we have a, a little less ability to hit those birds in the fall with harvest. We've, we've increased bag limits a little bit last, uh, last year again, last hunting season, 2013. And, uh, you know, but we only get a few shots at those, so the uh, opportunities for hunters were expanded in 1999 to go through more of winter time and up through spring so that we could get uh, a longer period of harvest on those birds as they head back north. Let me ask you this, why do populations have to be reduced? Well, it, it, it could be a lot of reasons really, but um, in the case of snow geese, uh, their impacts are on their breeding grounds uh, in, the, in the tundra habitats of the far north. Uh, and, and those impacts are hard to recover from. The, the tundra is a place that recovers pretty slowly from degradation, and uh, there's other species that use those habitats than snow geese. So as yeah, snow geese and Ross's geese have impacts on those tundra habitats, other species are negatively affected. So the goal was to try to reduce them uh, or at least stabilize their population growth, which you know, we're, we're maybe at a point where we can say that. It's, it's hard to know over a few year period. You have to, you have to really look at the long term to know whether or not you're successful, but uh, we're, we're looking to reduce those populations so that other species aren't affected by their overabundance. All right, let's talk about the conservation order itself. When does it start, when does it end? Yeah, this year we'll be opening uh, February 21st and closing May 17th. That's uh, obviously a little bit early. <laughs> Uh, we recognize that, um, but we just, you know, we, we have a, a pretty wide uh, time period that we can use uh, for that, for setting those dates, so we, we really look to just play it safe and, and have it start early. Um, you know, at some point, maybe someone will shoot a snow goose in February in North Dakota. It's not going to be this year. Some of those mild winters, though. You never know, <laughs> yeah. I know, I know a couple of winters ago there was like 1,500 of them down by Strasburg uh, in the middle of January. Sure. But that was an exceptionally warm <laughs> winter. They still weren't here in February though, unfortunately. Yeah, like you said, the weather does play a huge part in uh, when the birds return to North Dakota and when hunters can get there. Yeah, and it's not just our immediate weather here, it's also weather down on the wintering grounds and throughout their migration corridor, which is kind of, um, I guess if people are familiar with flyway lines, uh, jurisdictionally, probably not, you know, the, the eastern uh, border of the central flyway would be like uh, Nebraska, Kansas, the eastern edges of those states, and then the western edge of the Mississippi flyway states, Missouri, Iowa, that's kind of where the snow geese start coming up in the spring. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of birds stage in northwest Missouri and uh, central South Central Nebraska along the Platte River and the Rainwater Basin. So people that are really interested in where these birds are and they follow the migration, they watch the refuge reports? Uh, yeah, I there's. I think there's a few refuges along the migration corridor that uh, have pretty large numbers of geese that stop by and they do maybe weekly updates to, to kind of post those numbers. But other than that, it's uh, really kind of checking the internet to see where people are seeing birds. And sure. I have heard this year that there's birds in the Rainwater Basin. I don't know if they're still there. The, the in Nebraska. In, in Nebraska, yeah. The, the, the migration does bounce back and forth too as, as weather comes and goes. You know, we obviously a few uh, uh, weeks ago we had some exceptionally nice weather and uh, then we didn't. And if you're a bird in 
a situation like that, you're probably going to get up and move if you can. So <laughs> they do that a quite a bit uh, during migration, bouncing back and forth several hundred miles at a time. And uh, it's, it's just tough to keep up with. But yeah, by the time they get to North Dakota, you're looking at the third week of March, typically for snow geese showing up in the state. It can be a little bit later, a little bit earlier, and the, the I guess earlier or later that gets, the, the more drastic of changes you'll see in their migration where if they show up early, they might get bounced back south and not be here for a while and then come back and through much faster. And if they get held back longer and don't get here until, say, mid-April, they're likely to come through very quickly and we won't see much of them. I, I know during the fall, they kind of follow traditionally the same paths down through central North Dakota. Do they do the same thing in the spring? Yeah, in, in the spring, um, it, it varies a little bit depending on how much water is on the landscape from snow melt, but um, typically they're coming up through the southeast corner and uh, traveling up through the James River lowlands and then about the time they hit um, oh, I-94 or maybe even a little bit further north than that, they start to kind of spread out. Um, some birds continuing on straight north and some birds kind of angling off to the northwest. That's not to say that we don't have birds that come through other parts of the state, it's just that the migration is uh, much shorter, smaller numbers of birds, but I mean you will see birds all the way from you know slightly west of the Missouri River all the way over to the Red River. During the fall people use pretty much the same tactics, they decoy geese, uh, things like that, or they pass shoot. Spring might be a little different, people are using different tactics. Yeah, the the general tactics are still in play. Pass shooting is, is pretty useful. Um, setting out decoy spreads needs to have a little bit more consideration because of the environment you're working in, with it being a much muddier time of year. Um, you know, we strongly encourage people not to drive uh, their vehicles out into fields, pulling decoy trailers out into the fields. It's just not likely to end very well. Places that look dry could still have wet spots where people get could still get stuck or sure. do damage to fields. Um, so ATVs are, or, uh, you know, just carrying your stuff in or pulling in a sled is, is a lot better way to go. So that, that affects the, the way you can run your decoy spread quite a bit. Uh, and then, you know, when you're running your decoys in the spring, you can have other things like electronic calls that you can't have in the fall. Sure, that brings to mind uh, that there are quite a few different regulations uh, for the spring season, expanded regulations as it were. Yeah, that's right, Tom. We do have expanded regulations where um, people can have unplugged shotguns and electronic calls and hunting up to a half an hour after sunset. Those are the, those are the main three. And then the, the no the no bag limit thing comes into play, which, you know, with snow geese, if there is a bag limit, it's really hard to get anyways, but having no bag limit just expands that opportunity a little bit more just in case you're in that perfect situation. Right. Now these, addition, dates, these dates don't count against their, uh, right. their two seven-day periods? Right, and that's, and that's using that special 50-day or $50 license that uh, we, we don't use any of those time periods or adjustments against the fall days in that it's just for this spring. That's all it is. All right, and once again, it opens and closes? Yeah, this year we'll be opening uh, February 21st and closing May 17th. All right, Mike, thanks. Thanks, Tom. There are some licensing requirements and other regulations that you need to be aware of before hunting the spring snow goose conservation season. You will need a new hunting license April 1st. Your 2014 license is good up until then, but if you plan to hunt after April 1st, you'll need a new license. Non-residents will also need a new $50 license that's good for the spring season only, although non-resident youth hunters from participating states can get a reciprocal hunting license for the spring season. Also, anyone hunting during the spring season, residents and non-residents, youth and adults, will need a new HIP certification number. You can get HIP certified online or by calling 888-634-4798. That HIP certification is good through the fall hunting season as well, so make sure you record the number for your fall license and make sure you read the proclamation and spring conservation season rules and regulations thoroughly on the Game and Fish website at gf.nd.gov.
For Mike Szymanski and the rest of the staff here at North Dakota Game and Fish, thanks for joining us for Outdoors Online. We'll see you again next week.